Good day, it's Dr. J, and we have reached the last of our eight studies on the introduction to the Bible, our first four on the Old Testament, and three so far on the New Testament, and now the fourth one, and we're going to have to hurry along through the material that we have. Uh, we are starting on page 11 uh, of this section of the notes that you have. I hope you have your notebook before you uh, and have those and uh, are available to you on our church website. We finished last time talking about Paul's letters to the churches, and we enter into a section, uh, first of Paul's and then later others, of uh, letters that are the pastoral letters or the personal letters that take place. And the first two that we find, as we pick up on your notes, are the two letters to Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Uh, so starting with 1 Timothy, primary information for starters is written to encourage young Timothy as he leads the big city church at Ephesus. And Ephesus was a big city, uh, and so it would feel like a big responsibility. Uh, when we think of young, we may think of teenagers. There's a, a verse here in uh, 1 Timothy, Let no one look down on your youth, but uh, be thou an example to the believers. Uh, so uh, we think our young people like that uh, verse. I liked it when I was a teenager, but... Uh, on his youth, it was probably older than a teenager, uh, but still relatively young as an adult that would take place there. And how would you like uh, to pastor a church where you are the uh, so much younger than everybody else? I think I experienced that when I came to North Cleveland Baptist as a 26-year-old right out of seminary graduate. Uh, and you showed great faith in inviting me to be here. It can be intimidating, so Paul is giving him some courage to take place. The primary theme is on leadership. God desires godly leaders to lead his church. So we do find some definitions in there of the quality and character that you're looking for in overseers or pastors and deacons that are listed. You see the key verses there, and you can look, as always, those up on your own. Practical advice, overall structure. There is, um, I've had the word military in my notes. It's kind of like a, a being on guard. Uh, more than a, been, uh, on the offensive, just be on guard. Some of the military's role is to, to guard. Be on guard uh, against the enemies of the church. Be on guard against those things that would try to water down the gospel. Uh, guard the doctrine of the church against the false teachers that might be uh, coming forth in that way. The worship of the church, it's where it says about lifting hands and, and dressing moderately, mo modestly, excuse me, uh, the leadership of the church, we talked about the offices a moment ago. The purity of the church, a real call to godliness and guarding the practice of the church and the compassionate practices where you're taking care of the widows and the elders and the slaves. Uh, watch out for all kinds of greed. We find uh, here in Timothy's, the writing to Timothy. Pay close attention to these key words, charge, commandment, sound doctrine, conduct, and godliness. Uh, we use a lot of ordination services for ministers, maybe for deacons from the verses here, because we are laying down the, the charge uh, for them to put themselves in a, a higher plane of living with the responsibility that they take as a church leader. I ask you, put yourself in Timothy's shoes as you read this letter, kind of uh, help your church. What kind of expectations uh, should you expect out of those who would aspire, or God would aspire them to be leaders in the church, in their, their life, in their heart, in their doctrine, in their belief systems, in their homes and families, uh, and how they would conduct themselves. Then you turn to the little letter of 2 Timothy, primary information. Paul writes this letter, likely his last letter. There's really a sense of, of, of closing that's going to take place here as Paul was in prison awaiting his trial and his death. Uh, we finish Acts, uh, reading of Paul in Rome, and he's kind of got a uh, as pleasant as could be prison experience with lots of guests, people coming and going. Uh, this seems a little darker and harsher, uh, a more difficult time for him. Uh, Paul is demonstrating how a Christian martyr should face death here uh, in 2 Timothy. We remember, you know, I've uh, fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Uh, and we'll see here in a minute there, he's uh, very personal in this letter to, to Timothy, and he, he misses him, and he wants his company to come along, really, to, to minister to him. And you will see the key verses there, but again, you can look up on your own. 
practical advice for the study. Uh, Paul realizing that the gospel is going to live longer than he does. It's true for all of us. Uh, and so he wants to ensure that the doctrine is sound, the leadership is good. Uh, and so he is writing with these heartfelt words in this letter to Timothy, uh, to a pastoral appeal, a practical appeal, a prophetic appeal, and a personal appeal. And you can really read his heart here at the end when he says, you know, get here as quickly as you can. Come and visit me uh, as, as soon as you possibly can. Uh, unlike in other times when he had a lot of visitors, a lot of company, he says, only Luke is with me now. And he mentions a person named Demas. Uh, we have read of Demas just in passing in some of Paul's earlier letters, part of his team. And now he says, demon has left us because he loved the world. Uh, throughout Christian history, I've, I've been people, uh, I've known people uh, who were Demases. Uh, who were on the team with Jesus and serving and working and loving the church and suddenly distracted away and drawn away by something in the world. And uh, sad, sad, that may be one of the saddest verses in the Bible. And we read that and that has taken place. Uh, just a kind of an interesting reference here in verse 11 of chapter 4. He says, uh, get Mark and bring him. He is helpful to me. And we'll remember back in uh, in the middle of the book of Acts, where Paul did not want Mark, did not want John Mark to come along anymore. He had disappointed him on the first missionary journey. And so we read something kind of redemptive in there, don't we? We see a picture of, of successful ministry in chapter 2 as it's broken down there. First, I like that idea of the reproductive ministry. Uh, it's described in ways, you know, Paul says to Timothy, take what I've learned so I've given it to you. You share it with other leaders who will in turn share it with others. And there can be this multiplication that takes place. And that simple math, you know, you take something and share it to two people and they share it to two people and they share it to two people. And suddenly you have the multitude uh, and a little, that's a good model for the church, this mentoring role that you take the, the younger Christians. That's not necessarily younger in age, but maybe younger in the faith. Uh, and uh, you teach them. And they grow a little bit, and then they take younger Christians, and they teach them, and we're, we're moving up in our maturity and in our application. Reproducing ministry, enduring, studying, and holy ministry. I hope you'll feel the weight of Paul's concern for the church and, uh, and for his burden for himself. A, a little quick comparison here between 1 Timothy uh, and 2 Timothy of the abandonment, I guess, that you would say Paul is feeling. In 1 Timothy, see the word some is there. Some have turned, some have made shipwrecks, some have turned aside to Satan, some have been led astray. But in 2 Timothy, it's, it's much more discouraging, isn't it? All have turned away from me, all who have forsaken me. But he does give a word of hope there. But the Lord Jesus Christ stood by my side. And here's these uh, two very personal letters we find to Timothy. The next pastoral letter is the letter of Titus. Uh, Titus is written to a leader in the church at Crete uh, who had been led to Christ by Paul and a story there mentioned in 2 Corinthians 8.23. A fourfold purpose to remind Titus, appoint elders in the church. The church needs leadership uh, and it needs people who will take responsibility. Warn him against false teaching. Uh, he says in verse 10 of the circumcision group, uh, we get a little of this back in Galatians of this mindset of people who said you have to practice the Jewish laws. Your males have got to be circumcised. So scholars call these the Judaizers. Uh, you're a Christian, but you're hanging on the old uh, lessons and laws of the Judaizers of the tribe of Judah, of the Jewish heritage and the Jewish faith. And he's uh, making sure that they understand that's a false teaching. Third, to instruct Titus how to lead different types of people, as we read in there. And, uh, talks about older women, younger men, slaves, uh, help them kind of figure out their role. And then to encourage him regarding the importance of grace in the church. That primary theme we keep reading down, grace leads to godliness. The grace that we have received leads to goodness and godliness in our life. It's not our godliness that gets us grace. It's the opposite of that. The grace that we receive freely and it will inspire us then to seek to, even imperfectly, as we often do imperfectly, 
uh, reflect that grace around. There are some key verses. Let's look at the overall structure. Again, very short little letter. There is organizing the church, and then there is following Christ. And then note the emphasis on the good works, the grace that brings out the goodness and godliness that is there, bringing out the good works uh, and the faith that we practice. Then the little letter of Philemon. Uh, Philemon, uh, the introductory stuff, was written to Philemon, a Christian who lived in Colossae, who had come to faith through to Christ through Paul, kind of like we had with uh, Titus a moment ago. And the letter's subject is a man, man named Onesimus, who was a slave, once a slave that belonged to Philemon, who had come to faith in Paul through faith in Christ through Paul. Uh, so this is pretty cool. You got the slave owner and the slave, diametrically opposed on the economic scale and on the respectful scale of society, who both have found the same Savior uh, through the witness and testimony of the same man. Now Onesimus had escaped uh, before he met Paul. And so Paul is writing Philemon, and he's saying, I want you to welcome back Onesimus. Uh, now you get to welcome him back as a brother, because he's a brother in the faith with you. So uh, Paul writes to inform Philemon of Onesimus' salvation. He asks, more like begs, Philemon to forgive him and request uh, to come visit Philemon sometime, as Paul had this, this burden to, uh, to revisit those folks that he had known along the way. Practical advice for the study, see the picture of Christ as the redeemer of lost sinners. And uh, whether you're Philemon or Onesimus or Paul, uh, that we're all saved by grace, Christ came to save us all. Uh, see the effect of the gospel on slavery. Now, it took many, many centuries before really Christianity could finally say slavery is not something that is at the heart of God and it's not something he wants us to practice. And so it played out a long time before slavery reached its finality. But one of those passages you'd go to if you were trying to say this is not of God for a people to have ownership of another person's life uh, would be the book of Philemon uh, in the New Testament. See how the gospel transforms those relationships. This was your servant, this was your slave, and now he's your brother. Well, that completes the letters of Paul. But there are more letters in there. They're called the general letters. Nine letters not written by Paul, ordered basically in length. The longer ones at the front, the shorter ones that are in the back. And you'll notice the thing here, it's interesting. They are titled by their names of the authors, not according to uh, who they are written to. Paul's letters were, here's who I'm writing to. I'm writing to the church at Rome, so we call it Romans. I'm writing to Timothy, so we call it 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. But in this writing, we have uh, that it's uh, the person who is doing the writing who receives the, the namesake that goes along with it. And they are the more general audiences than uh, we find in the specific, especially pastoral letters. It's a little more easy to read uh, across the board to all Christians everywhere, uh, even though they are written to specific people uh, or specific uh, groups of people. Uh, we have first the book of Hebrews, and uh, the question is, who wrote Hebrews? And in the blank, you can write, God only knows. Uh, that is one of those mysteries, the anonymous author of Hebrews. And that hasn't stopped speculation uh, from people like maybe Apollos, maybe Luke, maybe Philip, maybe Mark. Uh, maybe Paul wrote it in the Hebrew language because it's the style that doesn't. It got translated differently. Uh, some say Priscilla or Aquila uh, there. We just don't know. Uh, when we get to heaven, I guess, we get to say, who wrote the author? Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Certainly somebody who was from the Hebrew background, who understood about the sacrificial system uh, that he describes a lot and parallels that with the sacrifice that Jesus had made. Most likely written to Jewish Christians who were facing persecution. By this point, uh, in the latter half of the first century, the temple would have been destroyed. They wouldn't have been practicing uh, the sacrifices, the Hebrew faith that had gone on there. Uh, and so he's kind of say that, well, now we have Jesus. We don't have to have a temple anymore because he's made the ultimate sacrifice for us. This is the most 
Christological, which is the study of Christ. It makes this thing, this most Jesus book, the theology of Jesus that we have in the New Testament. So its primary theme is the superiority of Jesus. It actually opens up in chapter 1 with uh, a section on that Jesus is superior. The message of Hebrews resolves around five exhortation, and they all begin with the word let us. Uh, I've jokingly preached on these and said I'm going to talk about five heads of lettuce, uh, not literally produce lettuce, but uh, of let us. And so you see, let us not drift from the word, let us not doubt the word, let us not grow dull toward the word, let us not despise the word, let us not disobey the word. The practical advice for study overall structures is following that theme of Christ's superiority. And as I mentioned a moment ago, it opens up a superior person, that he's, he's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels in those opening verses. A superior priesthood. Uh, they've had the priest, you know, that came. And a high priest. And now we have a great high priest that is seen in Jesus. A superior principle of faith. Uh, Hebrews 11, faith's hall of fame. Uh, that is shared these great Old Testament examples of folks who practice faith. And uh, we see these key words that show the superiority of Jesus, just a couple of them, better and perfect. You know, there's a lot of comparisons that take place in there about the, the priest. And now we have a better priest and a sacrifice that has to be repeated over and over again. Now we got a perfect sacrifice. It was taken care of in Jesus once and for all, uh, taken care of. Uh, see all the Old Testament references there. See and study the Old Testament everywhere in Hebrews. Of course, it's writing to people with a Jewish background. Uh, to Hebrew Christians are Hebrews who are at least seeking to know more about Jesus. And so talking about uh, the Old Testament and using them, that's the, the scriptures they loved and were familiar with. So building on how they point to Jesus. Things to remember. The author is quoting from the Greek Old Testament. Uh, so that's a little different sometimes than the Hebrew Old Testament. It gets translated into our English, so some of the quotes are a little bit different. The author argues many times, the lesser the greater, you know, the better and perfect words we said a moment ago. A human priest as opposed to Jesus, a complete priest, a human sacrifice, I mean, excuse me, a animal sacrifice as opposed to a, a perfect sacrifice. The author views everything in the Old Testament through the lens of Christ, how these Old Testament practices and promises uh, are all fulfilled in Jesus, to hopefully those from the, the, the richness of the Hebrew heritage uh, would also agree and say, here is Jesus, he is the, the, the completer, uh, the finisher of our faith, uh, Hebrews uh, says in chapter 12. We come to the book of James. James likely is James, who is the brother of, of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, there is some language in the book of James, uh, a word or two, that the only other place we find them in the Bible is in what James in Acts chapter 15 is attributed to saying. And that is what is called good textual criticism. That's good textual research, looking at the text, the words, and say when the, the, the only two places in the Bible in the New Testament this word is used, and it's used by the same person in very uh, different places. It's, it's probably the same person, or at least it's some evidence that it could be. And so thought to be this, the half-brother of Jesus, James. Written to address practical implications of true faith. That is, what does Christianity look like in action? What are the, the works? You know, I'll show you my faith by my works. Uh, so that we can't see faith, but we see the evidence of faith and the grace that has transformed us. Uh, key verses there for you. You can see in your note also the practical advice for study, the overall structure uh, that it addresses. James is a, a good book to study through and preach through because it'll talk about different avenues of our life, about how we are, are compassionate uh, toward the poor, or we're not compassionate toward the poor. Uh, the, the tongue, uh, what do we say? Are we saying things of, of grace and love, uh, or are we saying things and using our words in a negative, disobedient kind of way? Uh, so you can see those that are there. You can see Old Testament references everywhere in James, 108 verses, their references are allusions to 22 Old Testament books. 
Now, that's pretty amazing when you think you've got uh, just uh, uh, in this little short chapter of the book of this limited number of chapters here, you've got all these references and allusions to the teachings of, 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 uh, of the Old Testament there. Uh, and at least 15 references or allusions to the teachings of Christ. And so we've got uh, a lot to, that it looks back on trying to connect uh, the old and the new. Notice the emphasis on social justice. Uh, there's a verse there in James 1.22. Uh, religion our God and Father looks on as pure and faultless is to look after orphans and widows in their distress. Um, I taught on the, a study on women in the Bible recently about the widow of Zarephath and talked about how this uh, passion and compassion uh, for the plight of the widows and orphans goes throughout the scripture. And uh, she's an Old Testament example of a, a widow who needed compassion. And it just echoes in what James writes about this is a pure and faultless religion, that it shows itself uh, in the compassion that takes place. Now, I, I just put a note here about comparing this with the book of Romans. When Paul wrote Romans, and when we talked about that, we said he's very much trying to convince the Christians from a Roman background, the Gentile Christians, and those from the Jewish Christians, we all have the same problem of sin, we're all saved the same way, that we are sinners saved by grace, and it is our faith that gets us counted as righteous. Uh, it all takes place in there, and it's all that we're saved by grace. Now, James, we read a contrast because he's so much talking about works there, about, well, we gotta, we got to do this and do that. There's a, a, a story uh, from church history about Martin Luther, uh, who was convinced from the book of Romans, you know, we are saved by grace, and that there had been abuses taking place in uh, the, the church of his time was telling people, you got to do this and this and this to get to heaven. And when he would come back with his arguments that, no, we're saved by grace, the Bible says this, 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 they say, but the book of James, the book of James says this, this, and this. And uh, Martin Luther said, sometime I want to take little Jimmy and throw him in the stove because uh, it was a, a point of frustration. I don't really think there's a contradiction if you take the Bible and understand it as, as a whole. But that is the book of James. Paul addresses our standing with the world uh, before God in our grace, how we do that. James is addressing our witness for the world, that they would see the Lord through us. And the way that that is shown is through the works that we produce. Even Jesus talked about uh, the, the trees and the fruit. You know, the, you know a tree by its fruit, and the fruit is our works. Uh, but the nature from inside is what's transformed by the grace of God. We move now to the book of 1 Peter, uh, the first and second Peter there, written uh, to the church in Asia Minor, which is, is what is in modern-day Turkey. Again, facing increasing persecution and suffering, uh, Nero was the emperor, and the famous story that Nero uh, sets Rome on fire, or it's set on fire, he blames the Christians for it. And uh, so they start much more persecution is directed toward them than sometimes in the earlier things that, that we saw. Christians tortured, Nero's uh, punishment of the Christians, punishment, if you would, uh, to set some people on fire so that they would illuminate his gardens and such. It's, uh, it's gruesome stuff to find out about what he was up to. Major theme is the sufficiency of God's grace uh, and it's used in every chapter there, a lot of verse references for you to see. The practical advice for the study is the overall structure is a call first for holy living. In the middle of a difficult world, live out your Christianity. Living for the sake of the pagan world, that society and around you benefits by your witness and by your compassion that you show. Walking through sufferings as the church and the things that we latch arms together and we share in together and the strength that that brings. Some comparisons there and some verses in Ephesians and 1 Peter, just some parallels that are worth your independent study if you'd like to do that. But pay close attention to these words. 16 times suffering, six times about behavior and a way of life, God, Christ, Spirit, God's will, election, calling, salvation, and one of my favorite words, hope. Hope that is found and talked about there uh, in First Peter, uh, that we have a living hope. 
Uh, and these were people who were struggling, who were suffering. It didn't seem they had a lot of reason for hope. And so the writing is there saying, no, we, you do have a reason for hope, even in the midst of your suffering and your persecution. Learn how to live out the Christian life in the midst of suffering and persecution. Second Peter, primary information. Again, this is kind of like Second Timothy. I think Peter is getting very close to his execution. Church history says he was executed upside down, uh, crucified upside down because he didn't feel himself worthy to be crucified like Jesus. So it's close to this. Primary theme is growing in grace and in knowledge. You see the verses there and comparing the themes regarding the church that we find in uh, 1 Peter. Uh, Peter is writing about persecution but not as much about the suffering and persecution in this one as he did in 1 Peter. Uh, a couple of subpoints there, just of threats to the church. Uh, some in the imagery. Satan comes as a lion to devour of persecution, and that's not like the, the persecution outside the church, the Roman persecution, Nero coming after Christians there. Then Satan comes like a serpent to deceive the church in 2 Peter, and that's a little bit of uh, Satan working within you know, he's trying to undermine the theological foundations that we hold to and question and compromise those things. And so whether from attack from without or, or attack from within, uh, the strength in, of the, the church could be jeopardized. Practical advice for study. Uh, you see your notes, how they are, are lined out there. I'll just point them there. Uh, you can compare Second Timothy to see two perspectives of facing martyrdom. Uh, as, as Paul is in his closing time and now as Peter is uh, near the end of his life. And notice the explanation of the Bible's inspiration there in 2 Peter 1, 19 and 20, where God, excuse me, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we have this consistent message in Peter and in Paul before that Scripture is inspired by God. The Holy Spirit is working to lead people to write down the things that have been preserved for our benefit. First, second, third John. First John, as we start, it's a simple structure. Uh, when I was first taking Greek in, in college and then later in seminary, uh, your introduction, they called it baby Greek uh, because it had to be real simple. We were just baby Greek students. And uh, a lot of the places they took us in the Bible when we were learning baby Greek was first John because it was uh, more simple vocabulary and uh, easier grammar than when you got into some of the other New Testament Greek writings there. Uh, Paul states five purposes. They have fellowship, joy, they don't sin, they overcome error, and have assurance. These things I have written that you may know you have eternal life. That's a great verse, 1 John 5, 13. Uh, and when people say, I don't know if you can know for sure you're going to heaven. I say, well, the Bible says you can. There's a reason it was written. Uh, he wrote these things that you may know you have eternal life. And if Jesus really lived and he was who he said he was, and I think that can be a given, then we can have that peace and that confidence there. Uh, there's a, some wording in there about testing the spirits uh, so that you are seeing that you are walking constantly and consistently with uh, the rest of the Bible, uh, not turning your back on things. There were attackers of uh, the theology of the church called Gnostics. Gnostics didn't really care how you behaved. It was about what you knew. That's what Gnosis, knowledge, was. Just what you knew, the insight that you had. If you knew it right, everything was okay. Just do whatever feels good. Behavior doesn't matter because uh, it's physical and nothing physical mattered. It was all about the spirit. And so very much so, John is trying to address that error way that, yeah, the physical does matter. What you do uh, does matter of, of places. Key verses there. Practical advice. See how John uses a simple foundational words over and over again. It's for that simple Greek vocabulary. Love, know, sin, abide, world, life, and times. And you'll find uh, it's been compared there in my next statement to like a, a musical uh, arrangement that you have a verse and you sing a chorus and have a verse and sing a chorus like our hymns. Uh, that he keeps coming back to some of the same themes over and over again in 1 John. 2 John, uh, primary information. Uh, it's written, it says, uh, from John, but he calls himself the elder. By this time, he's the oldest, probably the, the last surviving 
of the disciples uh, at this point, and he talks about writing to the chosen lady and her children. Uh, I like that idea of that is a description of the church, the bride of Christ, the chosen lady uh, and her children and, you know, those who are part of the church. Um, maybe that's a literal lady in the church and primarily who makes it up, but I really think that the, the poetry of there is, uh, is, makes much more sense. The church must guard the doctrine of the incarnation. Remember I said a minute ago, the Gnostics were saying it doesn't matter what you do as long as you believe because the body is physical. And the Gnostics thought physical things were always corrupt and uh, there was nothing good about physical things at, at all. It was all about what you knew, the mind, the heart, the spirit. Uh, so Jesus could not have been physical. He could not have had a human body. Maybe it looked like a human body, but it wasn't really human. That's the Gnostic belief. And so they're coming back, the incarnation. No, the humanity of Jesus. The same John who wrote in the gospel. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Gnostics say the flesh, flesh is bad, flesh is evil. So he's writing again to remind them and hold them to this. Don't buy into this thing that the spirit is all that counts and the flesh does not. So avoid the false teachers that is going on out there. Uh, the key verses you have listed practical advice and the structure in this little book. Look over, look for words that are repeated over again in the blank, write down commandment 14 times, 14 times in this little book. This is, you know, I command you this. This is my commandment I am given to you. Uh, you have truth and some of the important words like walk, love, teaching, deceivers. Uh, again, very basic foundational things in 1 John, 2 John, and now 3 John. Primary information for starters, trivia question, the shortest book of the Bible. What's the shortest book of the Bible? That would be 3 John. Four different characters that are part of the description. John who wrote it, Gaius, the one who received it, Diophatres, who is the one who caused it, and Demetrius, who carried the letter to them. Uh, hospitality is a theme that takes place that... Uh, is offered uh, Diophyses, who is offering some, some hospitality there, but uh, he was basically causing a mess. Uh, so we're trying to work things out in there. Uh, Third John, verse two says, I pray you may enjoy good health and all that may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. So that hospitality in life, hospitality of your soul. Practical advice. The overall structure we see in those people, Gaius is that, prosperous Christian, Diophyses, a proud Christian. It says of him, he longs to be first and mentions him in association with gossips, refusing to welcome brothers, not practicing the hospitality that took place. Gaius was one, I think, that uh, did the better hospitality. Demetrius, the pleasant Christian, the one who got it right, the good example that is featured there. Practical advice uh, is, is provided for you. Now the little book of Jude, primary information written by Jude or Judas, again thought to be one of the half-brothers of Jesus, not as well known or seen elsewhere as James, the half-brother of Jesus, but thought that would be uh, this one. And the primary theme is contend for the faith, fight for the faith. Some things are worth fighting for, uh, and it's a picture of soldiers who are holding the fort, doing what is necessary to guard and contend for the faith. The two purposes you see, condemn the practices of the ungodly in the church uh, who speak against sacred things. Again, we've looked at uh, things about the, the actions, the immoral actions. And also says, go ahead and do whatever you want to. It doesn't matter. It's all thinking. And, and then the challenge of the theology uh, that takes place, the ungodly teachings that are going on. And counsel believers to hold fast and contend for the faith, to persevere, we would say. Practical advice. See the condemnation of false teachers based upon Old Testament examples. And you can just kind of see through those here in this one little book, uh, those negative examples there. And then Jude emphasizes at the end the power of Christ to keep the church to the end. Uh, I pick a, a scripture for our benediction every year. And we first Sunday in January, we start another one. We, we recited at the end of our morning worship services, 
all the way through December. We say it at every staff meeting that we have. And one of these days, I'm going to use the closing of Jude. Uh, it's a little longer and more complicated, uh, but it's a beautiful passage of him who is able to keep you from falling. And these discouraged folks, it says, contend for the faith, battle for the faith. It's worth what fighting for is to remember there is one who is going to keep you from falling. Uh, stand strong and be strong in the midst of that. In the last book, uh, the book of Revelation, can't really give justice to it. Uh, some years ago, I taught about 25 lessons just on the book of Revelation. I have a notebook. I have CDs. If you'd like to take that and independently study it, just let me know. I'll be happy to grant that to you. But we will give just kind of a thumbnail uh, sketch over the book. What genre is it? What kind of literature? It is apocalyptic literature. It tends for imagery, uh, a lot of uh, symbolism, numerology is big, so numbers represent things. They're not always meant to be taken literally, but they represent things of um, uh, 12,000, 144,000. Those are all representative numbers, and this book has no parallel. There's really nothing else in the Bible to compare to the book of Revelation. It has some places that are have imagery and apocalyptic ideas, like in the latter chapters of Daniel or in Ezekiel, uh, but it really kind of stands by itself. It's a, it's a challenging book to study. Uh, if you go into it, go into it deep and go into it long, because uh, it'll, it'll take a while to, to work your way through these things. Uh, one of the things I want to note out, this was pointed out to me by one of my New Testament professors, it's th called Revelation. Not revelations. There's not a plural there. So say the book of Revelation, and you'll be good with things right there. Uh, John gets a, a really interesting perspective here. As he, he, he writes what he has seen, and he gets to see earth and heaven at the same time. Something we, we won't. You know, we live on earth, we see earth. One day we go to heaven, we see heaven. But he gets to see heaven and earth at the same time. And I wonder sometimes when I've read through this, is, is he seeing heaven and describing it, or is he seeing earth and describing it? Uh, interesting uh, to try to figure some of that out. If you'll move on to where it says primary information for starters, you see it was written by John, uh, the disciple, when he was exiled on Patmos. Um, it's a little rougher Greek. Uh, one of the theories I've heard is that perhaps the earlier letters and gospel of John, that he had some help uh, with his... Uh, with his grammar and stuff, is putting that together. And on the Patmos, he's all by himself. And so uh, uh, not with a whole lot of formal training, maybe more like that that would uh, be the style that he was written in. Uh, he would be, you know, 90 years old. Uh, plus, uh, he was, uh, the persecution that took place under Nero was continuing under the new emperor Domitian. Uh, it hadn't gotten any better. It had even gotten a little worse. And so that was kind of his punishment. Rather than death, he sat over there in exile, and the other disciples all died a martyr's death. Uh, to Christians facing persecution in the first century is who he's writing to, much like some of these last letters uh, that we were looking, about the gospel and the future of God's kingdom, because uh, it would seem like uh, things were kind of harsh right now, and maybe they didn't have a future. And so there is an encouragement that takes place here. Now, he's, he's pretty honest with them, uh, as we'll see, because there's some hardships that he describes. It's a way of saying uh, things are going to get worse before they get better, but they do get better. The primary theme of the revelation is Jesus Christ. We meet him, he sees him in chapter one, uh, and it's always an overwhelming experience. It says again, he fell down, he fell down, you see the Lord, he fell down, he sees him on earth, sees him in heaven, he falls down. Uh, that's part of that wonder and holiness and splendor of seeing Jesus. Now, I'll give you some key chapters here, and you're going to see the key chapters are the first ones and the last ones, and frankly, they are the easier ones to seek to understand. We have the first chapter, as I said, John has the revolution of uh, revelation of seeing Jesus, uh, and then we have chapters two and three, seven letters to different churches. Some are doing well, some are not doing as well and have some things to work on or things that need to be addressed. And then we see in verses 4 and 5 really a, a wondrous worship in heaven uh, of there, of uh, the angels and the, the, the saints uh, and all singing holy, holy, holy. 
uh, and they have a scroll they're ready to open. Uh, but there's no one worthy to open. It's going to kind of tell how the future in history is going to play out. And uh, then the, the lamb who is worthy uh, comes. And that's when we come into chapter 6 and beyond. Uh, and so we have seven seals that were on the scroll, seven trumpets blasts that come later, seven bowls that are poured out. And it's like wave after wave after wave of difficulties, hardships, tragedies, disasters that come in these. I think that's part of uh, John's telling the Christians here, this is going to get worse uh, before it gets some better. And the big question we have uh, as we seek to interpret this, depending on perspective thing, are these things that have already happened uh, that are being described in this heart, big passages of uh, the book of Revelation? Uh, are these things that could be happening right now and we are in the middle of them? Uh, or are they yet to be? Uh, some things in the future. Now, we can categorize those as post-millennial. It's already happened in the past. Uh, not many of those. Amillennial that... We could be going through that now, uh, or premillennial that uh, we are waiting for the rapture and the Lord's going to come. We don't have to experience all these hardships because he's going to take us out before then. And uh, I think you can be a Christian and hold all those views, but that's part of the, the challenge of, of reading and sharing uh, in here. Practical advice for study. Look at the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. It's interesting. We go to Revelation. Go and say, I want to see how the end times are going to be. I want to see what the future is going to look like. And the book of Revelation points back. It's looking back in history. It's looking back to the Old Testament. So don't get too caught up that Revelation is about the future. Uh, a lot of the descriptions that we find there are about the past. 248 is that blank. 248 out of 404 verses contains references to the Old Testament. It's far more than half uh, of there. Psalms, Daniel, Zechariah, Genesis, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Joel. Uh, and this is kind of fascinating here, this next section, about how, as we especially get to the end of Revelation, we have a reflection of the beginning of the Bible. Uh, you know, there are four chapters in the Bible that are describing a earthly world without sin. The first two chapters and the last two chapters. And it is like uh, we say, you know, when, when all said and done, uh, God through Jesus is going to make everything right. And so everything that kind of goes wrong in uh, Genesis uh, is made right. Everything that as it was, we see the fulfillment of that in Revelation uh, from the things that went uh, that were part of creation. So let's kind of let's see. See, uh, created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, and we have a new heaven and a new earth that should be Revelation 20 and 21. Uh, so that's uh, amazing. The first Adam reigned on earth. The last Adam reigned in glory. It's a reference to Jesus. Night and sea created. No more night. No more sea. Uh, just a, a couple of reminders here in this ancient world before there was uh, ways of illumination we have with electric lights uh, that night was was darkness and mysterious and dangerous and now here's a place there's no more night and no more seas where was john experiencing this he was on an island and the ocean represented separation from his fellow christians and the fellowship and uh, all that he would have loved to have seen the ocean was there so here's a here's a land with no seas you may love the ocean uh but here's the picture of heaven that it has is there's no more seas a bride is brought to Adam in creation story. The bride is prepared for Christ in the revelation story. A tree of life in Eden uh, there and a tree of life in the new creation. In fact, multiple trees of life and uh, that bear fruit every month. I don't know any fruit trees that bear fruit every month, uh, but that's the description, this abundance of the fruit of the tree of life. Satan utters the first lie. Nothing with a lie can enter the city. Death and a curse. No more death, no more tears, no more, no more uh, uh, curse takes place. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Conflict between Christ and Satan. Uh, there's a little description in John chapter 3 about the, uh, your heel, your, your seed's heel will crush his head, the serpent's head. Satan's final doom is cast in the lake of fire and uh, meets his end. Man driven from God's face out of the garden. Garden is closed. Men see God in his glory. Heaven is open. That, uh, that eternity there is open. 
uh, for some help in understanding apocalyptic imagery, uh, remember the imagery is representative, a lot of symbolism that takes place. I'll use one that's uh, fairly commonly understood. Uh, that is uh, references in there to Babylon. Uh, Babylon, Babylon is thought that Babylon represented the Roman Empire that was persecuting Christians at the time. Sometimes referred to, and then there's a reference to the beast with seven heads. Uh, and Rome is a, a city built on seven hills, uh, famous for that from, from way back when. You know, so there's some identification there with the beast and, and, and the Babylon, uh, probably representing the, the wicked persecution uh, from the Roman Empire. John interprets most of the important things. This is the good news. If you really need to know, he tells you. And the favorite thing that you really need to know is in chapter 19 uh, when Jesus comes down on the white horse. Uh, right, white horse. Uh, people say, would there be animals in heaven? Well, there's at least one horse because Jesus is coming down riding on it. Uh, and because uh, right horse, and it says the rider of the horse is named Faithful and true. It doesn't come right out and say it's Jesus, but who's faithful and true? Who is faithful? Who is true? Who is the only one worthy to break the seal in the early chapters of Revelation? It was Jesus alone. And if that's not enough, he goes right along to tell you that on his, on his robe it says, King of kings and Lord of lords. So that pretty well tells you, you know, we know, we know who's coming there. We know where that representation takes place. See the visions as a whole. Don't press to me the details. Uh, you can get caught up in things and uh, start pondering. Some have uh, this represents that. This represents this. Uh, be careful. Don't try to open the book of, the, of Revelation over here and the, the morning newspaper over here and figure out how they're saying the same thing. Uh, again, don't get too, uh, too detailed. You get lost in something. In the end, the Lord wins, right? Uh, everything that is against him uh, in Satan, Hades, everything is cast into the lake of fire, and the Lord alone wins. We see the majesty of God in Christ all over Revelation. Uh, on the throne of glory, folks, and ain't holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Uh, Dominion, who was persecuting the church, was one of those emperors demanding that people would say he was Lord. And uh, Christians were being persecuted because they said, no, Jesus is the Lord. Uh, Dominion's not Lord. Jesus is Lord to the common Roman. Uh, what's one more? Sure, you're Lord too. But Christians wouldn't say that because uh, they believed exclusively Jesus was Lord. And that is emphasized and shown and highlighted. No matter how you read the book of Revelation, you come out with that message. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is Lord. Throne is mentioned 44 different times in the book. King, kingdom, or rule. 37 times, power and authority, 40 times. So we find that, the, the, the last chapter, read the end of the book, and you know who wins. You know who's in charge of things. Uh, I'll close with this as we finish this whole series. I remember uh, a, a man has asked you know, why he, he believed in God, and he believed in his hope was in, in the Lord. And he said, well, when I opened the Bible, it seemed like in the beginning God was in charge of things. And you go to the back of the Bible in the end, and it seems he's still in charge of things. And I don't guess anybody came about in between that was big enough to whoop him. Uh, and we really do find that. We find challenges, don't we, from, from Satan, from worldly empires, from egotistical world leaders and such, from persecutions and uh, lies and schemes. But nothing strong enough to deny that at the end, that Jesus indeed, King of kings, Lord of lords, past, present, and future, now and forever. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God bless you. Thank you for studying this, this uh, series with us. I hope it's been meaningful to you. I hope that because we've had this overall look of Scripture, when you do dive down and dig a little deeper into these passages, uh, they will uh, resonate in your hearts and, apply, and apply in your life even a little better. Thank you so much. I'm proud to have shared this time with you.